Uh, hey, well, welcome. I know that most of you were in the room earlier when I introduced myself, but my name is Anthony, if we've never met. I am actually a junior high pastor here at Cottonwood Church. Um, thank you for coming. And uh, yeah, I'm married to Raylene, who is somewhere around here. There you are. Love you, girl. It's a, hey, this is cool. We're gonna be, we're gonna, our anniversary is on Wednesday. We're gonna be married for three years. Isn't that cool? Um, so, uh, yeah, we're, we're married and uh, I, like I said, I am the junior high pastor here. If you're new here, first of all, welcome. Hope that you are enjoying yourself so far. Um, if you're new here, normally on Friday nights, there's a different guy here. Uh, his name is Pastor Sam. He's a little bit taller than I am, has better facial hair. Uh, him and his wife, Nicole, he, like it's sad, but it's true. Uh, him and his wife, Nicole, uh, are our young adult pastors. They are not with us tonight, but if you're new here, please come back and, uh, and meet them and, and, and hear them. Uh, but I get, to, uh, I get to step in this evening and continue in the theme that we've been in, which is the Book of Psalms. And like I said, if you're new here, if you're not familiar with uh, this space or what's going to happen, I'm honestly only going to talk for like 15, 20 minutes max. Uh, we're going to look at the scriptures together, and then at the end, the uh, people with the great voices and the amazing talent are going to come back up, and we're going to go back in uh, to another song of worship. So, um, yeah, we'll do that. But before we actually jump in to our text, I want to pray, and I know we just prayed, but I, I want to pray to, to kind of preface uh, looking at the word because... Um, we never want these moments to just be Christian TED Talks, right? Like, I'm, I'm excited about what I get to share, but I genuinely believe uh, that if the Holy Spirit can take these words and can make them real in your life, make them relevant in your life, uh, that something way more powerful can happen, you can walk out of here changed. And uh, I just know I've been a part of so many services where that's happened, so I know these moments are special. So if you will, will you pray with me one more time? Holy Spirit, uh, thank you for your presence. Thank you for the fact that you care uh, about each of us way more than we can imagine. And uh, right now in this moment, we ask that you would soften our hearts, that you would remove distractions. God, that you'd help me to get out of the way. You'd help me to, to find my place here uh, in speaking for you. And um, thank you so much for, for blessing these words and for doing what only you can do in our hearts and in our souls. Uh, we just give this time to you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Um, we've, uh, we've been in this series uh, at Cottonwood Young Adults this whole season, actually. We've been in this series in the book of Psalms. And if you've been attending Cottonwood Church on the weekends, you know in the month of March, our weekend theme has been Psalm 119. Uh, if you follow us on any of our social media platforms, we have update, uploaded daily devotionals in Psalm 119. Cottonwood Young Adults has a book of Psalms reading plan. So we're just in this book right now. Like we're, we're here, which is actually great. Um, the book of Psalms is beautiful in that it is... Um, you can't spend enough time in it, and it's not a book that you read through, and it's just like, great, I got it, I get it, I can move on. It's, it's supposed to be something that we sit with, that we linger, linger in really over a lifetime. Uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, if, if you've ever heard that name, he was a pastor, a theologian uh, in World War II, and he actually ended up being killed uh, because he was discovered to be a part of a plot that was going to assassinate Hitler. Uh, so he like really, he, he, he lived out what he believed in. Uh, and when he was writing on the book of Psalms, he had this to say, I'll throw up a little quote. By the way, you've noticed this by now, but that screen isn't working. So just heads up, don't expect anything to come up on there. He said, wherever the Psalter, book of Psalms, wherever the Psalter is abandoned, an incomparable treasure vanishes from the Christian church. With its recovery will come unsuspected power. This is a guy who lived through a lot more than we could probably even imagine. And he said, it's in this book in particular that actually comes in unsuspected power when you linger in it. If you're, uh, if you're familiar with uh, the name Martin Luther, he was uh, kind of the leader of the Protestant Reformation, uh, really influential uh, church writer. He said this about the book of Psalms. He said, the Psalms 
are a little Bible wherein everything contained in the entire Bible is beautifully and briefly comprehended. Everything in the Bible is beautifully and briefly comprehended. And I think that's such an amazing thought because the Psalms, they really do tell the story of the Bible. They, the, 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 the Psalms, they give us what the Bible gives us. The Psalms give us theology. They, they teach us about who God is and what he's like. Uh, the Psalms, they even they give us history, right? Uh, you have uh, writer after writer who records the history of the nation of Israel in poetic language uh, often. Nonetheless, they are recounting their nation's history. And then the Psalms, theology, history, they also give us anthropology. The Psalms are actually really unique in that the Psalms actually give us an insight into the human condition in a very unique way. In the Psalms, we see uh, every type of human experience. Uh, John Calvin, who was another super influential Protestant reformer, probably one of the most influential writers in church history, when he was writing his commentary on the book of Psalms, this is what he said. He said, I have been accustomed to call this book, I think not inappropriately, an anatomy of the soul. For there is not an emotion of which anyone can be conscious that is not here represented as in a mirror. In other words, the Psalms, he actually goes on to say uh, that the Psalms and the writers of these songs, they actually laid open their inmost thoughts and affections to call each of us to an examination of ourselves. It's in the book of Psalms where we're able to see the human condition. We're able to see what are our strengths and what are our struggles. What are our sources of hope, our sources of doubt, our sources of joy, and our sources of fear. And this evening, what I actually want to kind of zone in on and, and, and look at is one of those sources of fear. Um, and the way we're going to do that is I, I pulled a couple of verses. These are not sequential in the book of Psalms, but I want us to catch the pattern of something that we see throughout this book. So we're going to throw up a couple of verses from the book of Psalms, and I'll just kind of read them briefly. First one says, when I am afraid, I put my trust in you. In God, whose word I praise, in God I trust, I am not afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? The next one, Psalm 118, verses 8 and 9, says it is better to trust in the Lord. I'm sorry, it is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in humans. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. And the last one says, do not put your trust in princes and human beings who cannot save. When their spirit departs, they return to the ground. On that very day, their plans come to nothing. But blessed are those whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord their God. And if you're picking up the pattern in those couple of verses, again and again, we actually see the writers kind of make this contrast between putting our trust in God on one hand, and then on the other hand, putting our trust in people, putting our, our trust in others. And another way you could say that is you have these writers and they kind of compare two different lives. They compare one life where somebody finds their source of security and identity in God, and then you have another life where somebody finds their source of security and identity in other people. And if you've grown up in church, perhaps you've heard this phrase, this uh, what's kind of come to be, dis er, it has come to describe this condition, uh, and that phrase is the fear of man. And if you, if you haven't heard that phrase, uh, we get it from the book of Proverbs, chapter 29, verse 25. It says, the fear of man will prove to be a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord is kept safe. Notice again the contrast. You have on one hand, uh, you have people who fear man, and it says that proves to be a snare. And man there is obviously used in the, uh, in the representative sense for people. And then you have other people who trust or fear God. And that is said to be the wiser one. Again and again, if you remember in the, in the Psalms verses that we read, uh, the indication is clear that the smart choice, the wise choice, the right choice, is to trust in God. 
And yet what the Psalms show us again and again is that yet the tendency of humans, of people, of you and me, is actually to put our trust in other people. The tendency of, that we all have is to find our source of security and identity in other people. And I think when, uh, when it comes to that, we all, that, that all kind of, that affects all of us in different ways, right? Some of you in here, as I say, hey, when it comes to trusting in or finding a sense of security in other people, you're like, you kind of know right away, uh, yeah, that's something I do. Some of us, that's not necessarily something we do with everybody, but we do it with some people. Whether that may be friends, whether that may be a subculture, whether that is family members, oftentimes uh, we do this with our parents subconsciously, where their voice, their approval matters way more than it should, and yet it just kind of lingers in the, in, in the back of our mind. We, we all have those people in our lives that often, they cause us to ask the question, um, what would they think if I did this? What would they think if I acted this way, if I said this? And oftentimes, uh, we can actually play into that. And we will intentionally live our lives in such a way, sometimes it's small things, sometimes it's big things, but we'll actually live in such a way to try to control the perceptions other people have of us, right? I'll give you, a, I'll give you kind of a lighthearted example. I like to golf. I don't know how many golfers you know, but now that you know me, I am the worst golfer that you know, okay? It's just, like, I'll just be honest. Like, I picked it up as a hobby like two years ago, and I have not gotten any better since. And I, uh, I like to golf. Usually, the person I'll golf with the most is my dad. Uh, him and I will go to little par three courses, and you know we'll just have fun. And my dad knows that I suck. So when I suck, there is no pressure. I'm not worried about it. I don't care if it's just him and me. And I hit a bad shot. It's like ah, like that's golf. That's my shot. Whatever. You know, like I'm used to it. Uh, if you were to contrast that from when we get paired up with other people, if me and my dad go to play around and all of a sudden there's two other people at the tee and they're waiting and we're gonna end up being a group, um, I react to my golf game so much different in front of other people as opposed to when no one's around. Um, if it's just me and my dad and I had a good shot, I'm excited. I'm actually a little surprised, right? I'm like, what? Like, we're high-fiving each other. I'm like, I wanna write that in the calendar to save the date, you know? Like, this was my good shot day. When I'm with other people and I hit a good shot, it's literally, it's like, great. That, that's what I meant to do. Yeah, that's literally, yeah, no, it's, honestly, it's a little off, actually. I wish it's, I don't know, but, like, it's totally different. And then, obviously, vice versa. When I hit a bad shot, when I'm with, when I'm with my dad, I hit a bad shot, it's like, hey, that's golf, that's, you know, it is what it is. I hit a bad shot in front of other people, especially that first bad shot when they're still realizing how good I'm not. I hit that first bad shot, I'm, I'm shocked. I'm, I'm, lit, I'm dumbfounded. I'm like, what, where did that come from? What did, I'm, li I'm analyzing my golf club. Is there something wrong here? And if there's not, you know, I, I know what's happening. But all of a sudden, I have to, all of a sudden, you put other people there. And I wish it didn't happen, but I'm like, man, I, they, if, if, if they're gonna know that I'm bad, like I, I wanna kind of control the narrative a little bit, right? I wanna kind of adjust and modify certain things so that they, they understand me a little more. Maybe, maybe you've even seen your friend do this. Uh, I don't know if you've ever witnessed this in a friend where like you have a friend and, and you, you, know, you know what your friend is like, you know your friend's personality, you know what they like, what they don't like what they laugh at, what they don't laugh at, and then you ever see your friend get around some other people, it's a different group of people maybe, or your friend's trying to land a date and all of a sudden they become a different person. Like, it literally, it's, it's honestly like, your, your friend is laughing at things that they don't normally laugh at, they're telling jokes, they're like, you can tell they turned it on, they're all of a sudden, they're acting like they're into things you know they don't care about at all, and you're like, who are you right now, right? And it's, it's some of it is, it's normal, it's, it's connection, it's interpersonal skills, I understand that. But what I'm speaking to is that, that deeper side of it, that deeper side of all of us that so often wants to kind of cover and conceal the real us and instead put out something different, instead put out something that's more acceptable uh, or put out something that is going to be applauded more. And... Uh, 
the biblical example of this that at least came to mind for me um, is King Saul. If you're familiar with King Saul in the Old Testament, uh, we, we find Saul's story in the book of Samuel. Samuel, he's also going to be a, a key character for, for our story. Samuel was a prophet. He was a prophet appointed by God. Uh, and Samuel actually a, a, a appointed Saul to be the first king in the history of the nation of Israel. Saul's job, there, there, was, there, was, there was no king before Saul. Um, I mean, it was God, but that's a different story. Saul is supposed to be the person who unifies the nation of Israel, who protects the nation of Israel. He is a political and military leader. And actually, when you read about Saul's origin story, you, you find out really quick, Saul is blessed and Saul is gifted. The Bible says that he was a head taller than any other man. It, the Bible paints him to be this picture of this guy who's like, he's, he's got it. Like you could see he's blessed, he's gifted, God's hand is on him and God anoints him and appoints him to be the king over a nation. And yet when you read Saul's story, um, one of the things that you notice is he suffers from a character flaw and that is that he was ruled by the opinions of other people. Uh, I'll show you two, two quick examples. The first one, uh, chapter 13 of the book of 1 Samuel. Uh, we'll, we'll get there in just one second. Saul is uh, told by Samuel to wait until Samuel comes for Saul to offer sacrifices to God and for him to engage in battle with the Philistines. That's what he's told. He's told, wait for Samuel to do those two things. And we'll throw the verses up, I want you to see what happens. Saul remained at Gilgah, and all the troops with him were quaking with fear. He waited seven days, the time set by Samuel, but Samuel did not come to Gilgah, and Saul's men began to scatter. So he said, bring me the burnt offering and the fellowship offering. And Saul offered up the burnt offering. Just as he finished making the offering, Samuel arrived. Saul went out to greet him. What have you done, asked Samuel. And just notice the first part of his response for the sake of our time. He says, Saul replied, when I saw that the men were scattered, when I saw that the men were scattering, he goes on to explain his actions. But you notice the source of his justification is, well, well I saw how my men were acting. It's like, Saul, you had a command. Okay, but I saw how people were perceiving me. I saw how my men were starting to lose hope, trust, and faith in me. And therefore, I, I needed to do something about it. Fast forward two chapters to uh, chapter 15. Uh, Saul is told by, uh, what are his instructions? Yes, Saul, Saul is instructed to uh, go and attack the uh, Amalekites. This was a group of people who, if you read earlier in the narrative, uh, they, had to, they had tried to destroy the nation of Israel right when Israel had escaped uh, slavery in Egypt. And uh, Saul is told, go destroy this nation, totally destroy it. Don't, don't take anything, don't leave anyone. And here's what happens, it says, he took Agag, king of the Amalekites, alive. And all his people he totally destroyed with the sword. But Saul and the army spared Agag and the best of the sheep and the cattle, the fat calves and the lamb. Everything that was good. These, they were unwilling to destroy completely. But everything that was despised and weak, they totally destroyed. These, they were unwilling to destroy completely. Uh... Again, you have this instance where Saul is told one thing and he does another. And what ends up happening in this story is Samuel finds out, he approaches Saul, and just one, one last verse actually in the story. This is what Saul says when Samuel confronts him. Then Saul said to Samuel, after he's been confronted, I have sinned, I violated the Lord's command in your instructions, I was afraid of the men, and so I gave in to them. I was afraid of the men, and so I gave in to them. You have this man who is blessed, who is gifted, who is called, who is anointed, and yet again and again in his life, he's faced with a choice, and unfortunately for him, 
he continually chooses to cater to the opinions of other people as opposed to being obedient to God. That's what the fear of man will do. The, the fear of man, it'll, it'll lead us to live our lives for opinions rather than for obedience. The fear of people, us putting our trust in our source of security and identity in other people and their perceptions of us, it'll lead us to use our money to buy things, to, to, to pay for experiences, not because we really want them, mm -hmm. but because we want other people to see us with them. Mm -hmm. You can take it to an extreme. Some, some people, the, the fear of man, like, it'll lead them to go into careers that they don't care about, but they'll do it because of the paycheck it provides, because of the status symbol that it is. Not because God called them there, but just because well, well, with this job comes these, this attention and, and it comes, you know, the, the notice and the recognition and the respect from other people. The fear of man, it'll actually lead, uh, it'll actually lead some people to tell a lot, of, a lot of little lies. Sometimes big lies, but usually they don't start that way. The fear of man, it'll lead us to just tell like some little lies. Like, just spin the story enough. Just, just kind of change the narrative enough to where that, like, hey, when I'm telling you something about me, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of just shield things just the right way so that you understand, right? So I, I don't want to be misunderstood. Fear of man hates being misunderstood. It, it hates when people don't understand because misunderstanding, it, it risks rejection. It risks not being accepted. And obviously... If it's such a big idea in Scripture, we know that Jesus talked about it on the sermon or in the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, half of Matthew chapter six is actually devoted to Jesus talking on this subject uh, of not living for other people. Notice this is just the opening line to Matthew chapter six. Jesus says, "Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father." In heaven. Jesus will go on to talk about praying, fasting, and giving, and how all of those things can easily be used to impress and manipulate other people. And I think that's so significant because the fact that Jesus is talking about these things, it means that the fear of man, it doesn't just lead us to chase, you know, uh, worldly success. It doesn't just lead us to try to be good looking or, or to, you know, to, to make more money or to become more attractive. No, the fear of man will creep into our faith. Mm -hmm. The fear of man will lead us to actually try to make this Christian thing some sort of competition. Because how many of you know there are ways to flex as a Christian? I don't know if you've ever been around a flexing Christian, right? Like the person, they want you to know, I was up at 4.30 praying in tongues I basically summoned the sun to rise this morning. Like, you ever, you ever met people? They're, they're like, I just want you to know, right? Or I don't know if you've ever been to a Bible study with a Christian flexor where you have everyone's, you know, around the Bible and they're reading and someone reads a verse and they're like, ah, I just, man, I think, I think the verse, it's just telling me how much God loves me and stuff. And then you have the flexor that comes in and they're like, actually, in the original language, uh, in, in the original context, yeah, ah, right? Like, and hear, hear me, hear me out. I'm not, I'm not down on that, right? I actually care a lot about language and context. I'm not saying we, we need healthy hermeneutics. I'm not saying that, you know, bad interpretation. Yeah, we need healthy interpretation. I'm not down on that. I'm just saying, I think we need to ask ourselves the question, even in practicing our faith, are we doing it to be seen? Are we doing it to be noticed? Are we doing it to be perceived in a certain way? Are we posting things because we're genuinely passionate about them? Or are we posting things because I want people to think of me in this way? Um, Dallas Willard, he was a, uh, a Christian philosopher. He's gone on to be with Jesus now. He's probably one of my favorite writers of all time. Uh, he has this statement to say about uh, Matthew chapter 6. He says, our intent is determined by what we want and expect from our action. When we do good deeds to be seen by human beings, that is because what we are looking for is something that comes from human beings. 
God responds to our expectations accordingly. When we want human approval and esteem and do what we do for the sake of it, God courteously stands aside because by our wish, it does not concern him. The ego is bloated and the soul shrivels. Jesus would actually uh, go on in his ministry to criticize the Pharisees and the religious leaders of his day for, for this, this, literally this very same thing. Uh, we're not going to throw this one on the screen, but in, in Matthew 23, when Jesus is criticizing the religious leaders of his day, he said, everything they do is done for people to see. Everything they do is done for people to see. And then uh, in the Gospel of John, when John is recording Jesus' interactions with the Pharisees, um, he has this to say about some of them. He says, yet at the same time, many even among the leaders believed in him. But because of the Pharisees, they would not openly acknowledge their faith for fear they would be put out of the synagogue. For they loved human praise more than praise from God. I think that's why this is, uh, this is so important and so dangerous. Because the fear of man, it'll actually lead us to kind of tone down our faith. It'll, it'll actually lead us to kind of turn down the fire for Jesus. Because like these religious leaders, we'll look around and we'll say, like, man, if, if following him and being loud about him means I'm going to be put out of the synagogue, means I'm, I'm going to be put out of certain circles, means I'm going to be looked at as different, as, 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 as somebody who isn't with the times, as somebody who doesn't understand, if I'm going to be looked at that way, fear of man will lead us to kind of, I'm just, I'm going to tone it down. And it'll actually, uh, the Apostle Paul, uh, in, uh, in the book of Galatians, he actually says, he goes so far to say that the fear of man is essentially incompatible with being a Christian. He says, am I not trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Or am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. You know, the, uh, the fear of man, he says, if I'm doing that, I won't be a servant of Christ. And I think that's, that's important because you see the point of what this talk hopefully will be is not to get us to just not care about what other people think. Like we all know that's a, that's a valuable skill to have, right? The world knows that. There's a very popular, prominent book out there uh, about this subject. It's called The Subtle Art of Not Caring. It's actually, the title's really more explicit. I modified it. If you, if you know what the title is, you know what I did. Uh, but like even the world knows, hey, it's just, it's, it's, it's not helpful, it's not practical to be ruled by the opinions of other people, right? Like the goal here is not to just not care about what other people think. The goal is actually obedience to Jesus. Yeah. The goal is actually to become the type of people to, to, to the point to where when God says go, I go. When God says stop, you're trying to fit in, I, I, I stop. The point is actually to grow into the type of person where I'm more concerned with loving other people than I am with impressing them. And honestly, uh, and team, wherever you're at, I think you're on the back. You guys, you guys can come on up. I'm gonna start to close this thing up. Uh, honestly, the reason this is our topic tonight is because uh, when Sam asked me uh, to speak from the theme, I kind of asked myself the question, okay, uh, what from the book of Psalms has really helped me? And it would, be, it would be this truth. It would be this idea of not living in the fear of man. Because I can just tell you, I know firsthand exactly what it feels like to be a soul. Like, I know firsthand what it feels like to be a Pharisee. I know exactly what it feels like to uh, have an opportunity in front of me and I get to choose obedience or opinions. I've chosen opinions, like way more than I'd like to admit. I've actually learned how often uh, and how easy it is for me to ask myself the question, what are they gonna think of me? 
I've learned to, to literally, like I've learned how often that becomes a prism and, and a filter through which I make decisions, is how is this person gonna perceive? Maybe I don't think about just everybody, but I'm like, ah, there, there's certain people and I want them to think of me as a certain you know, type of person. I want them to think of me a certain way. And I have learned what a prison that is to live in. And I think for me, the answer to this, and th there are many answers, or I should say there are many ways that we can grow out of this by the grace of God and with his help. But what has really helped me is actually in some of those verses that we looked at to open up the night. Uh, Psalms 118, Psalm 118, it was one of the verses that we looked at, we'll throw it up on the screen, it says, it is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in humans. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. I have found that the more true that is to me, the more free I am able to live my life. Like the more true I, it, that, that statement is, the, the more I'm able to recognize it is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in other people. It's, it's like the fear of man gets smaller and smaller. And the way, the way that that has become true for me, I'm just, uh, the, the way that has become true for me is by sitting down with my Bible in the book of Psalms, opening it up and reading it and reading it again and reading it again and thinking about it and writing about it and actually letting it come into me and letting it overflow in me into praise. And if you didn't know, uh, the book of Psalms is 150 chapters, and it literally builds from the beginning to the end. From the beginning, it starts with this human hope in the word of God and a savior for God. And as you read through the book of Psalms, it does read uh, like it has an arc. And you see the human struggle. You see despair. You see fear. You see worry. You see hope, joy, laughter, sorrow, all of it. But the way it ends Psalm 150, the last verse of the book of Psalms, says, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. And that word, that, that, that phrase, praise the Lord, is actually where we get, or, well, we get praise the Lord from hallelujah. In other words, what's the remedy? What's the answer for not living under the tyranny of constantly trying to find acceptance and approval from other people, uh, the psalmist would say, in part, it is with your voice magnifying God and singing about how big he is, how great he is, how faithful he's been. And as you do that, it's almost like the, the eyes of your soul actually get open and you're able to see God that much more clearly. And as you see Jesus more clearly, you're able to say, oh, it's actually better. It's actually better to trust in him because he is more faithful. Because I don't have to prove myself to him because he knows I can't measure up. And it's in that place, I just say for my own life, where I have learned to find a sense of security that is way better than anything anybody else can offer me. So, obviously, I said at the... I said earlier that we're going to go back into a song, and I, I want to give us a chance to do this. And a message like this, I don't know what happened. I don't know what came to mind for you. I think this looks different in all of our lives. But I think it's there in all of our lives. And I don't know who the people are in your life who you would say, you know what, I, I give a little bit too much thought to their value of me. And I don't want them to do that because as long as other people's opinions matter that much, it will steer us from actually being obedient to the, to the person that God has called us to be. And moments like these, that's why I said these moments are so powerful, because moments like these, we're able to sing and we're able to be around each other and we're able to remind each other through song and remind our own souls, God is better. And God deserves, God is the only one who actually deserves my allegiance and my attention and I actually am called and I have been designed to live for an audience of one and that's him. So right now.